Testing. Oh, nice. All right. Um, cool. So this may be quite niche, but it should be fun. Um, basically, I'm going to be talking about um, the new ERC4626 standard, uh, which is the yield bearing um, vault uh, standard. Um, and we'll kind of just go through a couple of things, including like applications, uh, you know, why it exists. I'll explain the standard for those of you who are not familiar with it, but also mainly talk about how do we think about auditing and how do we think about like the security perimeter, uh, which I think is, is going to be a really fun uh, thing going forward. Uh, if you are familiar with like auditing ERC-20 contracts and worrying about how many decimals they have or ERC-777, I think it's about to get a whole lot more complicated than that is the kind of the message of this talk. Uh, so I, you know, I'm the founder of Auditless. Um, we do consulting projects uh, for blockchain teams, basically building protocols uh, from scratch and have been involved in also you know, security uh, developer tools. Um, and general kind of infrastructure developer tools as well. Um, I'm also working on Yagi, which is uh, our kind of first protocol, which is uh, built on StarkNet. And Yagi is two things. It's a keeper network, uh, kind of much like Gelato or Chainlink keepers for StarkNet, uh, but it's also a yield aggregator um, that builds ERC4626 vaults. And kind of a lot of the things that, uh, you know, come out of this talk uh, basically came from kind of learning and, and building uh, Yagi with this kind of very nascent standard. Um, so yeah, so what was kind of the motivation of ERC-4626? Like, why does it exist in the first place? Um, so historically, um, every yield aggregator used their own standard. Um, they were similar in the sense that, you know, most yield aggregators were smart enough to represent their shares as ERC-20 tokens, so you can actually trade them. But then in terms of like, how do you actually mint and burn tokens and so on, they, they, they kind of fairly different. Um, but there's also a lot of other things other than yield aggregators that look the same, right? So there's yield sources like Compound, Aave, Lido that kind of uh, are maybe simpler than yield aggregators. They don't really invest money in a bunch of different places, but they effectively take some tokens, they compound them and return them back. Uh, and then um, when you talk about trying to make integrations, obviously having these different implementations is really painful. And, and so you can start thinking about you know, using these vault shares in lending protocols or, or linear pools, which I'll explain, um, or also other DeFi aggregators, and it starts to get really complex, right? So, uh, you know, companies like um, Zerion, for example, had to basically write implementations to incorporate Yarn vaults. But, you know, for if somebody else said, hey, I'm also a yield aggregator, but, you know, with a couple of guys in, 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 in my garage, they would probably say, no, well, get a bit bigger and then we'll integrate your vault. Versus with ERC4626, the idea is that um, they could just integrate that standard and then uh, add a whole bunch of other teams very easily. Um, so the goal here is basically let's, let's unify both yield aggregator vaults and yield sources into one composable standard. Um, historical influences, uh, we actually have uh, someone from the, uh, the, tri the tribe uh, um, who is going to keep us honest, hopefully, uh, Tom. Um, so uh, actually, you know, this standard really came from, from, from kind of the, um, the collaboration between Faye and Rari. Um, and, and then I think the Yearn team got involved and also helped kind of use their learnings of what they've learned kind of building these vaults. Um, and so it's had a, it's had a cool bunch of uh, people actually work on, on crafting it. Um, and so you can check out the history of that as well. You can check out the EIP. There's also a nice forum thread where people are hashing out the details of it. It's quite fun to look at and actually uh, you can see the collaboration happening there. Um, but yeah, I think the motivation was basically the Rari team started to look at integrating different lending protocols. Uh, into into their uh, into their vaults, um, so um, yeah, very 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 uh, good use case for this. Okay, so so who's using ERC four six two six today? This is actually quite a few teams. Um, I think we we're going to see much more users than that. But you know the the main kind of teams building vaults and also some of the lending protocols are now starting to integrate ERC four six two six natively. I think on Starknet especially, I can I can see that some teams are adopting it a lot earlier than maybe teams on Ethereum. So I think it's very optimistic in the future. And the more people we can make aware, the, the more integrations will happen. It's also fairly easy to write wrappers. So if there is an existing you know lending protocol that doesn't use ERC four six two six, the Rari team has already written some wrappers for that. So uh, Compound, Ave, and so on, you can access to a 4626 interface already. Um, OK, so how does it actually work? That's the fun part. So it is an extension of ERC-20, right? And so all, all that's really saying is that 
um, when we deposit into a vault, we get some shares of the vault back, right? Which means we own 2% of the vault or 5% of the vault or whatever it is, right? And so these shares are ERC20 tokens. That's what I mean when I say 4626 is an extension of ERC20. Um, the other thing that's specific to it is that there's a single underlying asset, right? So typically in a 4626 vault, you basically be depositing ETH, for example, and then getting some vault shares back. That's kind of the essential idea. You can't sort of have a vault where you need to deposit both ETH and then you know, some other asset like USDC. Uh, that's just not expressible in the ERC4626 standard. The key functions you have, so asset gives you the underlying ERC20 token. Um, again, this is not the vault share, but this is the actual token that's being compounded, right? Um, you have deposit withdraw, which is based on the assets. You can say, I want to deposit two ETH into this vault. You have mint redeem, which are kind of, kind of similar, but they are saying basically, I want to mint three shares of this vault rather than deposit two ETH, right? So just a different, um, there's this kind of equivalency between the underlying assets and the, and the shares always. Um, and then you have a bunch of different functions that came from how Yearn is doing their vaults. Uh, so you can do preview deposit, so which means you can preview how many shares you're gonna get if you deposit, for example. And, and similarly, you can preview uh, withdrawals and redeems. Uh, you have max, which shows you the deposit and withdrawal caps, which is pretty cool. Obviously, lending protocols can have them for safety and, and vaults can have them for safety and so on, very common thing. Um, they're also user specific, so some users can have a different cap than other users, which is pretty cool. Um, um, so if you, you could even blacklist people from participating in vaults and express that using this. Um, it, you can also see the total assets, which is basically, you know, sort of how much ETH is being kind of governed and managed by this, by this vault. And then you have convert to shares and convert to assets, which basically is a way to get the exchange rate between assets and shares, right? Between effectively Ether, for example, and kind of the, the vault shares. Um, so let's do, let's do an example to illustrate. Um, let's do CDI. Is everyone familiar with Compound protocol? Yeah, so basically super simple. It's a lending protocol. You lend some DAI, you get some CDI back, which is a token that just represents, you know, interest bearing DAI. Um, so we can create an ERC-46 wrapper for that. The asset, underlying asset would be DAI. Uh, the vault would be minting new CDI. Um, and then you could have a max withdraw check, uh, which basically checks, you know, if the lending pool is insolvent, then you cannot withdraw all your, your money. Um, and then max deposit could check some lending limits that exist, like uh, supply limit. Um, so hopefully that's all good. Let's look at uh, templates. So um, it's pretty easy to implement ERC four six two six contracts these days. I think one of the that's one of the main reasons actually that I like to use it, and I think it's 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 it reduces the security surface for everyone basically. There's there's template contracts. Uh, two popular ones are Open Zeppelin and. Uh, Soulmate. Soulmate was the original one. Um, so I'll just, uh, as an example, kind of show you how they implement the deposit function. So basically the cool thing with these templates is if you use them, you don't have to write deposit, withdraw, mint, redeem, all those things are basically handled by the template. And you're just writing, turns out you're writing very, very little, which I'll, I'll show, to actually implement your custom ERC-4626 implementation. So what, what does deposit do? So as I mentioned, basically you're providing a set of assets that you want to send to the vault. Um, and then the receiver, which could be you usually, but then you could also basically say, oh, I'm depositing die, and I want, you know, um, some my, my friend to, to get the vault shares rather than myself. Um, so, so first, we'll basically run the preview deposit and check that, you know, that's, uh, we're getting more than more than zero. There's actually a debate on the, on the, on kind of how, how that should be handled, but I'll, I'll gloss over it for now. Um, then you're effectively just getting the assets in, right? So very simple, you need to improve and then a transfer from. Then you're minting the vault shares, right? Uh, again, it's an ERC-20 extension, so we're, we're minting some shares. You, you made a deposit event. And then the cool thing is you have this after deposit hook, right? And, and so that's where the magic happens. That's where you write your own custom logic for your ERC-4626 implementation to kind of handle what actually is happening with that money once it gets deposited. So the cool thing is like all this logic is for free and then you get to define like exactly what happens, right? So for example, in the CDI case, in the after deposit function or hook, uh, we could say, oh, this is where we actually lend it into compound. This is where we access the compound and, and mint some, some CDI. Right? Um, and so the very similar thing uh, is true for withdraw, but let's look at some other functions. So you can, for example, uh, you can, um, uh, Open Zeppelin has a, has, a, has a similar template. The only difference I really noticed is that they have this sort of is vault collateralized function 
um, that uh, basically, um, you know, it modifies how the max deposit logic works. Um, so it checks for things like, you know, whether the total supply is zero, are there any total assets? So basically, is there anything in this vault effectively? Um, cool. Uh, but yeah, I think either implementation is, is, is fine to use. Um, so yeah, so how does an example vault look like? Well, as I said, you really just have to extend these hooks. So this is a, this, the Fuse C token wrapper implementation, probably the simplest thing you can have an ERC-462 token for. And then all you really do is you kind of, you have a custom constructor uh, where you can you know, provide some details. In this case, it's just, we're just saving like, you know, which C token we're talking about, right? Uh, and just remembering that. And then you have these hooks that you override. So for example, before withdraw, you can, you can override and check um, you know, that like there is some, um, there is like, we're, we're actually redeeming some, um, some, some value and there's, there's more to that function. So basically super, super simple stuff. Um, you're just really ex expressing the actual logic of transferring assets in each hook, and then you're kind of done. So I, I provide, I provided sources for all these. So if you want to check out these implementations in code, you, you can do so as well. Um, Okay, so just to make sure we understood what ERC-4626 is and how it works, let's, let's play a quick game. So I'll give you an example use case, and then you'll have to let me know if this use case is expressible with ERC-4626. Um, so, right, let's try this one. So we discussed lending on compound, but let's say we add a quirk, which is we create a vault where we can lend on compound and then, uh, for example, lending die. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sell any comp rewards for more die, and then reinvest in the vault. Uh, raise hands who thinks that it can be implemented as an ERC four six two six. Okay, who thinks it cannot? Okay, so first group is accurate. The 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 the, the key thing here is that. Uh, we sold our comp rewards for DAI, which means that it's the same underlying asset, right? So all we're just doing is we're just inflating everyone. So if, if, if for example, 100 DAI was deposited, we got some rewards, we got $20 back. Uh, now everybody is like 20% uh, richer, basically, in the vault. So we're still fine. It, it still works. Um, okay. Uh, so another one, deploying liquidity into Uniswap V2 pool. So let's say we are a li uh, liquidity provider. We have two tokens, and we want to create a vault that basically abstracts this idea of like minting and liquidity share from these two tokens. So, who thinks it's a ERC four six two six vault can be built from from this? Okay, and raise hands who thinks it cannot. Okay, some people not so confident in general. Uh, the, the the second group is correct. You cannot. So the if you have two tokens, um, you generally cannot put them in an ERC four six two six vault. There's always a single underlying uh, asset that's you know used to mint the vault share. There's an exception to that, which is if you already have the liquidity share, well, that's an ERC-20 token. You can, you can definitely build a vault where you deposit a liquidity share and then you do a bunch of things with it, right? So you can do all sorts of your curve rewards and so on that just accept a single liquidity share, that works. But you can't actually do a vault that act, actually mints the liquidity from, from two different tokens. Uh, and the idea is basically because like these vaults need to be fungible. If I own, you know, twice as many shares as somebody else, um, I, I, I have effectively a claim on twice as many underlying assets as somebody else. Okay, so another one is staking a token to receive an inflation. So let's say we have a we have a token, uh, you know, we have our favorite NFT project. We have some token. Let's call it chairs. Uh, you can stake your chairs token and then get more chairs basically sent into this vault. Is that an ERC four six two six? Lift your hand if you think it is. Uh, lift your hand if you think it isn't. Okay, first group is correct. Yes, because there's single underlying token, you, you actually can. So again, basically, you're just gonna figure out like, you, you can literally, if you have an ERC-4626 vault, you generally can always like send additional underlying tokens to it, and it would just get divided evenly if you implement it correctly across everyone who owns it. So staking contracts is a very elegant, you actually can really simplify the development of staking contracts um, by using ERC four six two six, because like really all you need is like you just like you just send 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 uh, tokens to the uh, to the vault, and then some way for the vault to figure out like okay how many tokens are here, uh, and then when somebody deposits, it's automatically going to have the sort of exchange rate logic of figuring out like how much you know these shares are worth. Okay, uh, so staking an LP share liquidity share to get rewards 
in another token and then immediately selling it to more liquidity shares. So let's say I have a liquidity position with USDC and DAI. I want to deposit that into the vault and then I can get some rewards, liquidity mining rewards that I'm going to sell into more liquidity shares for USDC and DAI. Raise your hand if you think this is ERC4626. Okay, raise your hand if you think it isn't ERC4626. Okay, this one is a trick question because the liquidity share is already an ERC20 token, right? So now it looks just the same like DAI to the point of the ERC4626 contract. You're just, you're just depositing it as a single underlying asset, even though you technically got it from combining two different assets, right? So the key thing is like, at the point of depositing into the vault, that's where it matters whether you're depositing a single ERC20 asset versus multiple. You can only do a single base. Um, okay, so another one. Um, Everyone familiar with ERC-1155 is basically a generalization of ERC-20 and ERC-721. It effectively allows you to have a single contract which governs multiple tokens, which could be fungible. So you could have like, we could have a single contract where we have chairs and tables, for example, as two different tokens. So um, raise your hand if you think you can use ERC-4626 with ERC-1155 tokens. Okay, raise your hand if you think you cannot. Okay, uh, very good. Yes, you cannot. So um, unfortunately, um, again, ERC-1155 doesn't really work like ERC-20. You, you would have to write a wrapper on top of the ERC-1155 contract into an ERC-20 contract, and then you could, uh, but that's, that's kind of cheating. Um, okay, so let's do something more complicated. Um, uh, let's talk about creating an options or derivatives vault that aims to purchase ETH put options, uh, for example, in USDC terms uh, from market makers. Uh, who thinks this can be done in ERC-4626? Okay, who thinks it cannot be done in ERC-4626? Okay, well, um, this one actually is a, a little bit of a trick question as well. So if you're familiar with, anyone familiar with Open's design for options? Oh yeah, cool. So, so what Open allows you to do is it allows you to basically um, kind of issue options. Um, they will be ERC-20 tokens. Um, uh, that will have a certain kind of strike maturity and so on embedded into the into the vintage of that um, token. Um, when the the option strikes, it, it typically comes like out comes another ERC twenty token, which is the one that you're promised. Um, and so, in in the condition that uh, you're able to get market makers to basically in some programmatic way to sell you the options for the token that's going to come out of the option. So let's say we're doing ETH put options, which are going to pay out USDC. If you create a vault where you're able to basically pay them in USDC, get an option, and then when the option strikes, you get some USDC back and then reinvest in the strategy, then yes, you can have a ERC-4626 options purchasing strategy. Um, so we have this like new trend of DOV options vaults. You know, Ribbon is building some, as other teams building some. Uh, I think these will also eventually, uh, some of them will be ERC-4626 vaults. Okay, so what are the implications? Um, basically, um, the implications are, you know, you can have much easier DeFi aggregation. You can have any familiar linear pools. Uh, so very simple. So uh, linear pools are like liquidity pools. Uh, for example, um, you, uh, people are familiar with LIDAR, right? You, 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 can, you, can, you can stake ETH and can get um, staked ETH back. But the problem is you can't go from staked ETH to ETH, right? You have to kind of wait. Uh, and that's kind of why we have this like depegging situation right now uh, in the market where staked ETH is technically worth less than the underlying ETH. Um, because once your ETH is staked, you, you have to wait uh, for a certain period of time. So people created uh, basically uh, liquidity pools, which uh, where you can you can have ETH and staked ETH. So if you have one, you can go to the other and vice versa. So those are called linear pools. Typically, to, to make a linear pool, you need to express some sort of underlying exchange rate between the two assets being traded, right? And so ERC four six two six gives you that. Like let's say we put staked ETH as an ERC four six two six vault then we could use the convert to assets function to figure out how much a single share of stake ETH is worth in terms of the underlying asset. So we could create a linear pool that has a stable swap invariant kind of centered around the spot price that's given by the ERC4626 vault. Um, sorry for people who are not familiar with like stable swap and AMMs. I'll gloss over it, but yeah, basically this gives you the ability to create these AMM pools much more easily without creating custom implementations. Uh, you can also use vultures as collateral. So you can imagine having lending protocols incorporate 4626 and historically, urine shares have been incorporated as well. But the problem with like, when you create a lending protocol, you need an oracle for the collateral, right? You, you know how much this collateral is worth. So that's fine if you're using, you know, uh, compound or whatever type of asset where you can have custom logic. But how do we add a long tail of vaults? Well, each year C4626 vault actually effectively builds in its own oracle. 
it has the convert function to go from shares to assets and from assets to shares. So therefore, you can use vault shares as collateral implicitly. As long as you have an oracle for the underlying asset in the vault, you for free get an oracle for the vault share. Um, and then you can have better intra vault composability. So vaults could build on other vaults very easily. And then you can simplify development as we saw a little bit of staking, vaults, lending protocols, and so on. Uh, okay, so what are the, so this is the cool stuff. Like what, what are actually the security pitfalls? Like what are you, what are you going to be able to look for in bounties and, and so on when, 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 uh, when, implement, uh, when seeing people implement uh, ERC 4626? So one is when people override deposit and withdrawal logic. I mean, these templates provide a deposit and withdrawal logic. I've unfortunately seen people do that. Uh, there's a temptation to not be able to express things in the, in the hooks. Trust me, you can do a lot with the hooks. And generally, you don't need to override the deposit and withdrawal functions for ERC 4626. So if you see someone doing that, that's a warning sign. That's where you should probably look into it. Um, these core flows are very well tested. So generally, um, just increases your security surface if you're trying to modify them. Um, Okay, so second one is misusing max withdrawal and max deposit. So in the specification, uh, preview withdrawal is always meant to return zero. So it means that you're always meant to promise the user that, that like you, you're, you're always meant to show them how much they could withdraw in theory, right? So if the user owns some positive amount of vault shares, you always have to tell them that they're gonna be like, what is that worth basically in preview withdrawal? However, there could be a case where they are not able to withdraw that. So for example, if again, they deposit in compound, compound went insolvent and that you temporarily couldn't couldn't withdraw those shares you the withdraw function would revert but the preview withdrawal may still return the actual kind of promised underlying amount um, so again some people will violate this and have preview withdrawal return zero uh, which uh, uh, could cause issues if it's being used further down the line um, okay so another one is the zero share case so there's been a disagreement about how to handle that some people think it should not revert it with the Solman implementation it actually reverts uh, I think this is generally a good idea, but um, the open Zeppelin one doesn't revert and we'll go through with, with zero. So be careful with, you know, seeing people handle that case and making assumptions about different implementations. Um, so finally, vaults as price oracles. Again, as I mentioned, vaults will serve as price oracles for vault shares, uh, you know, in with respect to the underlying asset, right? So die, see, die, uh, stake, eat, eat, that kind of thing. Um, these preview functions should be very precise. Um, convert functions and total assets functions can be estimates. So in the spec, it's declared that, you know, convert functions can be estimated uh, because they may be used as price oracles. And if you, you can go look into the, if you're not familiar with the cream finance hack, that's where basically urine was abused because urine had these kind of very hard coded oracles. Um, and, and they were used uh, to basically artificially like mint shares and manipulate the oracle price. Um, so it, it wasn't basically it wasn't urine's problem, but it was one that in the way that urine was then used, um, you know, created issues for cream finance. So this is how we're meant to mitigate this by using kind of oracles that maybe could be time average, for example. And these are, these are gonna be kind of good practices. One careful thing is that the Solman implementation, uh, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't, in, in, like, it doesn't assume any sort of time averaged approach or anything like using oracles. It's actually fairly uh, hard coded uh, to, to use the preview functions. So you have to be careful and make sure that, think about basically how you're the vault may be used by other protocols. Um, and then kind of generally not all ERC-4626 vaults are built the same. Uh, there's so many different use cases for 4626 vaults. Uh, if you want to use them as collateral, you, you want to make sure that the value can be withdrawn, right? Because like, how do you liquidate someone if you can't withdraw their, their assets, right? So, so some ERC-4626 vaults uh, will not be able to always withdraw the money. Uh, they, they should not be used as collateral, basically, because the lending protocols just break. Um, Another example, so if you're using a vault as part of another investment strategy, let's say you're building the yield aggregator of yield aggregators of yield aggregators, and you have like a lot of ERC-4626 vaults, well, if you, if you wanna do that, uh, you need to have the ability to mint an infinite amount of shares for each vault. So for example, Compound always allows you to lend a bit more money, right? They're just gonna reduce the interest rate um, for, for borrowers, but, um, but there's some investment strategies that are capped. Uh, if you have a capped investment strategy, it's very hard for someone to build on top of it because when new capital is added, they won't be able to mint and invest you know, more in that strategy or they have to write carefully you know, some logic for, for that. So, um, and, and I, so I generally think that with ERC-4626 vaults, we're really going to get to a world where there's many different gradings uh, where it's almost like the ERC-777 thing where we're really going to treat these things differently based on what is a collateral ready vault. Or what is a linear pool ready vault? Or what is a, a vault that can be used in a yield aggregator? And it's probably many that I haven't thought about. 
Um, finally, there's also vault extensions, which is pretty cool. You can look into those. There's people trying to create vaults that su uh, support multiple tokens um, and you know, adding voting and things like that. I think we're going to have a rich ecosystem of extensions as well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my kind of early learnings on, on 4626. You know, please get in touch if you have some other ideas or things you've, you've come across. Uh, there's also a free security resource that um, um, you'd be welcome to look at. Uh, which basically contains, you know, a bunch of articles on just general security process, internal reviews, things like that. Um, if you enjoyed the content today, um, yeah. So this is kind of how it looks. I've been basically collecting these things to kind of make sure that you know we don't make we don't make mistakes and we learn from our mistakes and hopefully you find them. You know, some things I found useful. Hopefully you do too. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, please follow me on Twitter if this was interesting. But uh, yeah, let me know if you have any have any questions about four sixty two. Yeah. It sounds like uh, it only works for fungible tokens. But did you say it's also only when there's one type of fungible token involved? And, and if so, why, why is why is that? Yeah, exactly. So it does. So first, yeah. So it does only work for fungible tokens. Um, you know, those are the ones where you can have kind of really interesting um, yield compounding kind of scenarios. Um, I think there's early thinking on how NFTs could be used uh, to, 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 to compound yield. There's people building protocols on that, but it's, it's a lot more limited because there's very few opportunities to kind of park your NFT and get it back. It's very easy to turn your NFT into an ERC-20, like for, for example, an NFTX, and then you can sort of you know, do various things with that, but you've kind of lost your, your specific NFT. You can now redeem like a random one. Um, so as for the second question, which is like, yeah, why is it just one asset? Uh, and I think it just boils down to um, like two dimensional fungibility is like really hard. Uh, you know, if you have a, a different amount of two assets, it, like there's a very kind of finite set of objects that you can construct. I think the, the, the Uniswap V3 liquidity range is like one of them where like there's real kind of fungibility. And, 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 it, and it turns out that I think ultimately, you know, in, in these cases, uh, you know, most of the designs you would do in two dimensional assets, you can decompose into like two separate vaults where you're just depositing one or the other. Um, so I think we, we need to just discover more actually use cases for having two separate vaults that come together uh, that are that are useful. Because like, again, with, with liquidity shares, basically you mint and you just get an ERC-20 token, right? So now you can just deposit it as an ERC-20 token. There's kind of very few cases where you meaningfully have this almost like vector deposit or vector-based deposit. But yeah, I'd love ideas on, on, on cool investment strategies with that. Yeah, I, I just wondered why, uh, why why would it be the rewards have to be in, paid in the same token? I could, I could see that, for example, you get rounding errors if you have two fungible tokens and you, know, you, you wouldn't get, it wouldn't, wouldn't be perfect. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a good that's a good point. So, why does the reward have to come in the same underlying, right? So, so yeah, so technically, technically, it it, it doesn't, right? So you could still, so you could have an ERC four six two six vault that you deposit something, you get some rewards in another token, and then it doesn't reinvest them. That's also totally fine, right? And you could also that could be a fine strategy. Um, you could also provide a separate function to then claim those rewards for, for users. That's also totally fine, like totally, totally uh, supported by the standard. It's just that you, you don't really have a meaningful way of then saying, you know, each user holds some sort of like two dimensional position with like the two underlying assets, right? You generally just have the one and the other basically. Yeah, that's a great point. You technically, you don't always need to, you know, liquidate everything into the underlying asset. You can, you can let users do whatever you want with it. Sort of like another extension that's possible is like, um, so in the same way that you can control how people get assets out and then they get more assets in the course of being in the vault, you can also control how people get in the vault as well. So, you know, there's like, um, you know, ribbon vaults, for example, they, they have these epochs where you, you deposit and then you're gonna get allocated in the next epoch. Uh, again, 4626 would support that. You know, the way to do that would be to sort of add some sort of asynchronous deposit thing where you, you deposit it synchronously and then, you know, uh, you get the, your, your asset kind of gets allocated and then you get the kind of the right to, to deposit like at a, at a later point, for example, or, or, or you get the, uh, the right to withdraw that at a later point and things like that. So yeah, the, there's, um, there's a lot of scope for how things go in and, and get out of the, the, the vault and like who do you give the privilege to depositing and who do you give the privilege to withdrawing and how, how are they, you know, unlock that privilege, right? So you, for example, say, oh, you can't get your, 
you can't deposit any, you can't withdraw anything unless you stake a specific type of NFT and then you're allowed to like deposit from this vault. So you, you can kind of work with that. But you know, that affects down the road of like how many people can integrate your 4626, right? And so that's also an important concern. So like if you want it to be integrated in lending protocols and so on, then you want you you have a much more restricted set of behaviors that you can build in your 4626 vault. Yeah. Across any projects that uh, are vaults, but with mix of like ERC20 fungible and non fungible tokens, I've seen a couple of things. Uh, right. So projects that combine, uh, yeah, I think the typical one is, I guess, like, you know, NFT staking, um, where you, like, you'll stake an NFT and then you'll get some ERC20 rewards that then will get compounded. Yeah, but that's like, the, it's for collections where you, establish a bottom uh, bottom price for all the NFTs in the collection. But I mean, like you stake an NFT, uh, your C20 and in return you receive an NFT, for example. Uh, I've seen a couple of projects like that. They basically encode a, more information into the NFT than they could encode in, in your C20. So you would get an NFT return for your, your C20. Oh, okay. So I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, I guess like, yeah, I mean, like technically, I guess Uniswap V3 is like a version of that, right? A Uniswap V3. Because, it, you know, you deposit in Uniswap V3, you need, you need two ERC20 tokens, and then you get your concentrated liquidity position, which is minted as an NFT, right? Because basically it's like, they're, they're so non-fungible that it has to be an NFT, right? Uh, so you sort of lose you kind of lose a lot because you, you know, it's like now you have to collect fees manually and now you sort of, you can't really, it's much harder to create, like on, on Uniswap A3, it's much harder to create, you know, fungible positions on top of them, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's totally, I think that's, 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 that's totally, to totally a valid use case. I'm sure like we'll, we'll see a lot more um, kind of th those types of things as well. But yeah, it's just like, you, you can't do much with, with like, with NFTs basically. It's like, cause this, the NFT standard basically says we have a bunch of things that are all different and they have some attributes. So it's like, um, you know, I think it's super, super, super difficult to, 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 to build like standards around that. 